workers and search articles. When we decided to arrange this training program, we, the faculty members of history department, planned to invite VC sir. We approached our department's former HOD, Dr. J.K. Sir. sir met, uh, we met sir and asked to invite VC sir. Why? Because J.K. Sir is VC sir's uh, classmate. Over a call, sir disclosed the message at once. VC sir accepted it. I thank you very much, uh, sir for accepting our uh, invitation. We thank you, VC sir, for um, uh, accepting to train the trainers and we welcome you wholeheartedly. I welcome Dr. Umesh, Vice Principal Project. Here I proudly say, sir is the mentor of the history department. Welcome, sir. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Vice Principal Project, sir, who generously helped us to make this event uh, even come together to become a success. Even though our department is a very early start one, our faculty like me, we are new here. Both the dignitaries on the dais are very, um, very well at research and project. That was the reason we invited you, sir. We welcome you both. It's time to welcome our beloved staff members. I welcome you, friends. We are in the situation where we are not able to engage in, in research or meet the present pressure condition in higher education. That knack, knack, knack exit today and the workloads on the higher education roads. We are in a position where there is room for research in the existing workload. So we decided to correct our grievances and needs. This is sir, teachers. Please teach us about the uh, uh, opportunities available in the research field and train us to be a good researcher. I welcome the senior professors and other assistant professor of the history department. I welcome you all. I welcome our department uh, postgraduate students and undergraduate students, friends. I ensure this training program will be fruitful for everyone present here. Once again, welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Every new beginning comes from some other beginning's end. The more you take responsibility of your past and present, the more you're able to create your future, you see. Next, we look forward for the presence of Dr. A. Umar Samir Jabasiran, Vice Principal Project of Bishop Iba College, on the stage to give away the inaugural address. Warm good morning to all all gathered here. It gives me immense pleasure in standing before you to speak about uh, research paper writing for professional development to give the inaugural address. Uh, most respected and esteemed uh, resource person of today, President yeah, Rajendran, yeah, yeah. former Vice huh? Chancellor of Alagappa University, uh, Kare Kodi. Uh, he is a much thought of person and a well informed person. <laughs> This is not a, a new visit to Vishayba College. In fact, he has come many times to our college, uh, probably as a commission member, and he has been helping our college in uh, various dimensions. So, uh, my personal thanks to you, sir, for accepting uh, this invitation for this particular faculty development program. As I said earlier, he's a much sought out person as well as a well informed uh, person. And we are privileged to have you in our midst, sir. I also appreciate and congratulate the head of the department, uh, Dr. Samila, and other faculty, faculty members and the participants uh, for joining this FTP program. Probably you may be wondering why this particular FTP program is organized. As you know that as a teacher, publishing a paper is a mandatory one. Those days are gone. I remember that you know, I joined in Bishop College in the year 1986. So during 90s, uh, then uh, Principal Professor Samira used to tell, publish or spirit. That is a dictum uh, used in a foreign country. Now, after the introduction of uh, NAC and NARF, so it becomes a part and parcel of our academic activities. Earlier, we used to teach 
we don't concentrate on lot of the projects or publishing paper now if you want to be a good teacher definitely you need to have some publication in this context i think this particular uh, webinar has more relevance today and uh, it is also an indicator of academic excellence the number of paper you publish in a peer reviewed journals and reputed journal that talks about your credibility in the field of academic excellence and uh, nowadays what happens uh, if you are going to publish a paper in web of science or scopus then definitely your reputation your credibility will go high that's what uh, nas as well as the nrf expect from the teaching fa faculty and uh, not only that no if you uh, now uh, we are going to submit our uh, nrf code maybe uh, before the end of uh, february 11 so okay they are given the deadline and what happens in those days i remember that uh, i was a uh, uh, nas coordinator twice maybe on the uh, second cycle and third cycle now they we consider only the total number of papers okay probably if one person is publishing 10 papers or 12 papers okay we consider that now after after the recent uh, uh, guidelines nac and nrf if each and every individual is not going to publish a paper that is going to affect our marks or affect our grade which means that if there are 10 faculty members working in a particular department and if three faculty members are publishing maybe a, a 10 on an average maybe 30 papers but if nrf consider only three faculty members are published rest of the seven they consider they have not published the same scenario is also reflecting the new guidance of nac isn't it they convert into percentage and we'll be getting a lesser percentage i remember that when i, when I was uh, writing in the uh, executive sum uh, summary and uh, even the departments in social work department which, uh, where i served see we published nearly uh, 20 papers okay so the total strength of the faculty is only five so uh, i just presented that on, a, on an average every year we publish four papers but if you go deeper into the aspect only two faculty members we were publishing that 20 papers but now the entire scenario has been changed okay if they are going to publish only two faculty only the two the number two is only considered not other three likewise is the need of the other that is why i think uh, the department of uh, history has meticulously organizing this particular uh, conference once again i'd like to congratulate uh, madam and why is it this particular uh, fdp program right that is uh, research paper writing or writing a research paper now if you take uh, i said the nrf and uh, uh, nas if you take global ranking okay in global ranking also lot of uh, importance has been given for paper publication writing a research article so the the international affiliation agency like uh, times higher education then QS World Ranking and Shanghai Ranking Consultancy where they talk about the publication, they give weightage for that. Uh, in QS Ranking, faculty uh, a citation per faculty, they have allotted 20% of the mark. If I am going to publish a quality paper, then only other researcher will be citing that. So, they are given importance for the uh, paper publication. Likewise, if you, if you take um, uh, times higher education and uh, QS ranking for citation they have allotted 30% of the total mark and for research they have allotted 30% so altogether 60% allotted for research as well as for citation so this is a need of the other I think uh, Professor Rajinan is an expert in this particular area definitely after this particular FTP program is over what you were and what you are now and what you will be i could definitely say that there will be a difference i can expect many papers from this particular group okay of course other faculty members are also publishing yet i want you to publish papers in the reputed journal that is uh, web of science or scopus because often we we are hearing a lot of predatory journals and, uh, and uh, in recent uh, times, I have seen some of the cloned journals. So please, aware of these journals. Don't publish your article in that particular journal. Okay, you need to aware of that. 
and as far as uh, this particular FTP program is concerned, the entire emphasis is given on research. What is research? Searching for something new. Or in uh, social science, we talk about uh, solving a social issue, solving a problem, isn't it? So for that, what is the most important thing is that you need to have knowledge on the research, how to carry out the research, okay? And that particular uh, conceptual theme should be uh, relevant in nature. The current issues, what is happening in the society, you take up that as your research problem and you try to view it in a different angle. For, uh, for example, this is a mind. Now I'm seeing it from this particular angle. Now I'm going to give my own observation. Rather, we call it as a findings in research. Okay, if I'm going to see from this angle, I'm missing a different dimension, different uh, factors. Or if I'm going to see from this particular angle, I have different uh, findings I may arrive in. Likewise, in which direction you are going to see, for that, the review of literature will be very useful. That is why whenever we uh, guide research students, we are will be asking the research student to identify the research gap. Okay, the explored area and the unexplored area. If you are going to take an unexplored area and you are going to conduct a research and if you are going to uh, uh, identify uh, some important findings, definitely that is going to be eye opener for the field which you are serving. Definitely that paper will be accepted. You take a research topic, you identify the explored area, get some knowledge on that and you have a lot of reviews and try to identify unexplored area, what we call it the research gap. Try to address that particular issue. Definitely whatever findings you are going to arrive at or whatever meaningful inferences you are going to arrive at in that research, that is going to be a new finding. For a, that may be eye opener for your own uh, field of expertise or your own field or your own discipline. Like, likewise, now in the social science we talk about uh, three types of uh, research. Okay, I'm not talking about pure research and applied research, I'm talking about the techniques. What we call it a quantitative technique where a lot of importance is given to the statistics. Okay, whenever you just uh, talk about findings, you talk about in terms of numbers, maybe a mean or percentage. Or sometimes uh, you mean some hypothesis test, t test, f test, chi square, or a correlation like that. That's a quantitative uh, method of uh, analyzing the data. And another one is called qualitative uh, analysis of data, where we, uh, we talk about interviewing, or sometimes we use uh, focus group discussion. We take a particular case and we uh, have a cross section analysis of a case. So this is all called a qualitative uh, analysis of a data. And off late, uh, 2003, that's one uh, uh, professor called uh, Creswell, he has introduced mixed methodology, combining qualitative research and a quantitative research in a single research, that's called a mixed methodology, using a mixed methodology. Now, when you are going to publish a paper on mixed methodology, it's recently introduced, isn't it? So, definitely the uh, journal, journal will be, your article will be published in a reputed journals. Try to use the recent uh, techniques in your open. I think uh, uh, there are a lot of people from uh, are coming from, uh, I think I uh, see some of the science faculties are there, as well as the uh, history, economics and other disciplines are there. So think about any new trend emerging in your own field. Okay, as I said, mixed methodology is a new trend. 2003 only they have introduced and five of my PhD scholars, they got a degree using mixed methodology and they have published paper on that particular area. And uh, off late, though the transdiscipline is a old concept, now it is getting a momentum. Transdiscipline. Normally we talk about the inter interdisciplinary research, isn't it? You take a, a common theme and you try to analyze the different disciplines perspective. For example, if you take a, a budget, budget 2022. Now the historian will be seeing from the historical point of view over the past five years or over the past ten years how the budget has been prepared, they see it in a historical perspective. A sociologist will be seeing in a sociological perspective, in what way this budget is going to be helpful for the uh, society to uplift the uh, downtrodden. And in economics, they see the perspective of economics, okay, the growth, the GDP like that. Likewise, it is going to be a comprehensive uh, finding you are arriving in 
and that uh, uh, research is called plant disciplinary project, uh, plant disciplinary method. So you can adapt various methods for uh, your own uh, research. For that, the most important thing is that uh, knowledge. You need to gain a knowledge, the research aptitude. So I won't say that knowledge is alone enough, but skill is also very, very important. Whatever I have it here, it's called knowledge. And how far I'm able to translate knowledge into action, that is called skill. Now, here is a professor, a uh, uh, well-renowned professor here. He is going to talk about how your knowledge in your own discipline can be translated into action, that is a skill. How effectively you are going to submit your research article in a reputed journal. That is what the entire faculty development program is meant for. I don't want to take uh, much of this entire time. Uh, thank you very, very much. God bless you. I think definitely there will be a difference after attending this particular program. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, sir, for your meaningful words. The more you prize and celebrate your life, the more there is life to celebrate. Hard work keeps the wrinkles out of mind and spread. It now will be the turn of Mr. Manhadi, Assistant Professor, Department of History, to come onto the stage to give away the Chief Guest Interaction. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am profusely overjoyed to take the opportunity to introduce our resource person um, for this program, Faculty Development on uh, Research Paper Writing for, uh, for uh, Professional Development. So he is uh, none other than Professor N. Rajendran. Uh, he is the former Vice Chancellor of Alagapa University, Karikudi. So he is known for his work in teaching and research. Uh, seven years as a lecturer in Pachayapas College in Chennai. Eight years as a lecturer in the Department of History, Bharatasana University. Eight years as a reader in the Department of uh, History in Bharatasana University. Ten years as a professor and head uh, in the Department of History, Bharatasana University. One year and four months as a founder director in the Bharatasana uh, School of Management, Bharatasana University. So in the administrative side, sir has a wide experience. Uh, Deputy Warren Bharatasana University, administration of uh, men's hostel. Coordinator in the university with the potential of, for excellence. Coordinator in Ruse's King, chair in uh, School of Social Sciences, Bharatasana University. Director in charge, Center for Social Exclusion and Inclusive Studies. Director, the Center of Nano Studies, Head of the Department of History, Bharatasana University, Dean, Faculty of Arts in Bharatasana University, Founder Director of Bharatasana School of Management. Sir has a 20 years experience as a member of Board of Studies in a different universities and colleges. 25 years experience in the member of Academic Council, 4 years experience as a member of Executive Council. As a member of a professional and academic bodies, uh, General Secretary, Tamil Nadu, uh, Tamil Nadu History Congress, General Secretary, South Indian History Congress, Life Member in Indian History Congress, Epigraphical Society of India, South Indian Numismatic Society. So as a member of Research Board uh, in Bharatasana University, Periyar University in Salem, Thiruvadur University in Velu, Tamil Nadu Open University in Chennai, Alagapai University, Karakudi. Besides, he is also known for a lot of uh, Publication of research papers. Once again, uh, it's a great honor for me to introduce our resource person, Professor N. Rajendran, sir. Uh, sir. Give a big round of applause for our resource person. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I'm glad to invite Dr. A. Umesh Samuel Jabasiyan, Vice Principal, Bishop Eva College, to honor our chief guest by adorning the shawl. Thank you, sir. Now I request our beloved head of the department, Dr. Femina Alexander, to present a memento to our chief guest as a token of love. Thank you, ma'am. I cordially invite Professor T. Arlanandu, Department of History, to honor our Vice Principal Projects, Bishop Viva College. With the momento as a token of love. Thank 
Thank you, sir. Words have incredible power. The right words may be effective, but no word was ever effectively as a rightly time passed. The keynote address casts the light of his knowledge upon us. So, without any consuming time, I would like to call upon Professor N. Rajendran, former Vice Chancellor of Alagapai University, to accompany us on the stage to enlighten us with his words of true wisdom. <laughs> A very warm good morning to Dr. Umesh, the Vice Principal and Director of Research of Vishwakar College, the Head of the Department of History, Dr. Samila, and uh, Dr. Arlan Andam, faculty members, and learned uh, colleagues, scholars. First of all, I will say I am very much pleased to be here with you. As uh, Dr. Ramesh was mentioning, um, I am not a stranger to this uh, college. No, way back in 1989 when I joined Bharti Dasan University. And the first meeting, if I remember correctly, I attended a seminar, like uh, a seminar was organized and I was invited, uh, that was related to history, though I was the Department of Futurology, I was invited uh, by the Department of History here in uh, Bishop Birth College and I think uh, since then I have been coming to this college almost every year, almost every year. And even as uh, Vice Chancellor, I think uh, two years back I was here addressing the convocation. So, uh, it is not a new role for me to be here. And secondly, though white chancellorship is a passing phenomenon, basically I am a teacher. So, I feel that I am very comfortable in the role of a teacher. As an academic administrator, I have done my role and I uh, have been uh, consulted. That is also there, but still, I like uh, to be a, a teacher and also share my views with, uh, uh, say, a professional colleagues. Uh, Shakespeare would say, in uh, say Julius Caesar, in the Mark Antony would in his funeral oration, he would say, "I have not come here to bury Caesar." Similarly, I have not come here to praise Isa. Similarly, I have not come here to teach the teachers. I have come here to share uh, my own understanding of both the knowledge sphere that Dr. Ramesh was telling, that is history, as well as research methodology. Because research methodology is not a static uh, phenomenon. Uh, still, I am trying to understand. You may say that uh, I have, uh, of course, I have written a book also on historiography uh, for students in Tamil, uh, which means historiography is nothing but uh, research methodology, what we call in social sciences. And historiography is a unique word that uh, is being uh, used for writing uh, history. It's an art and science of writing. And that is what historiography is all about. In fact, today's uh, uh, discourse would be on that particular aspect, what we call uh, historiography itself. Because only in uh, history discipline we use this word, in uh, no other discipline we use this word. In all other disciplines of social sciences and even sciences, we use the term research methodology. But uh, this is a common terminology used for almost all the disciplines, but only in history we use the term historiography. Sometimes people may not understand. People belonging to other disciplines and uh, even laymen sometimes find difficult to understand what is historiography. But historiography itself is a very dynamic and moving frontier, which means uh, the methods that was followed by the what we call for every discipline you have a father, like social sciences you have Augustus Kahn, and similarly for history you have sociology you have Augustus Kahn, similarly history we say for politics you have Aristotle, 
And similarly for history, you have Herodotus. So since the date, days of Herodotus, I don't know whether the methodology remained the same. Or that is the question. And uh, uh, because the methodology is constantly changing, the uh, what we call the objectives of research also is constantly changing. And Dr. Ramesh was right in saying that uh, uh, today, uh, in the modern world particularly, we are uh, having certain, uh, we have to fulfill certain demands. It is uh, quality and also excellence. These are the two things that are uh, in fact taken into consideration. Because when you said NAC and NIRF, only those institutions which have, uh, which are within the 100 ranks of NIRF and those institutions which have got A and beyond the A, they get certain benefits from MHR. Gone are the days when uh, the planning, uh, so every five years you have pla planning funds given by UGC. They say third plan and I think I was there in Bharati Das until uh, the last plan, seventh plan I was there. So then they stop. There's no more uh, planning is there because now funding is based on performance. Funding is based on performance. Performance is not proportional to quantitative increase that is also is there. There should be quantitative increase, there should be qualitative uh, say excellence also. If uh, they do not go hand in hand, then I think uh, this is uh, reflective in almost all, uh, uh, say, our ranking system, particularly NAC as well as uh, NIR. So this is, uh, uh, research paper is one such factor, research uh, parameters are one such factor, but there are others also. Why we should publish in international journals? Why should we write in good uh, journals? This is a question very often asked. Uh, that is because there is also a parameter in NIRF as well as NAC in all the world ranking systems that they have uh, Dr. Umesh has mentioned like QS ranking and uh, Times and uh, of course Shanghai ranking. These are the world ranking and there you have perception about the institution. Supposing uh, you we say Alapa University while I was there, our perception was particularly when we came across QS ranking, we were 20th, we were given 20th rank when they introduced QS India ranking. That was in 1918 19. And what was our perception? Our perception was less than 20, even around 10, which means Alaba University is not known to the outside world. But our research parameters were almost equivalent to 90. Um, equivalent to that of the number one that is uh, IIT Bombay. But I, IIT Bombay's perception was more than 95. So now you, you, you must uh, try to understand that uh, this research is not uh, say an exclusive domain of increasing your own uh, H index or I index or your department's H index and I index. No. It has a relationship with the perception of your institution also. That is very important. And that is the reason why the task given to us when we became, when I became the Y channel, because we are already A plus, plus now in the present day. Even today we are the number one because uh, 3.64 is so I think the highest uh, ranking, highest uh, CGBA that uh, any institution has got or university has got. But the most important thing is our H index was only 62. So MHRD said, Brother Rajendran, we want, they called 10 universities for 100 crore funding and then said, if you have to increase your H index by 80 in another two years. After 33 years, we have reached 62 after 33 years of existence. And in two years, I have to show I have to increase the university's H index by 20 
point. And in the, you know, the secretary was beside me, education secretary. He said, Professor, you have kindly accept, otherwise they will not give you the money. I said, yes, we will do. When I came back, uh, then all the senior professors said, how is it possible, sir? They have an average uh, say, year, we are uh, achieving two points in H index, which means now 62. 62 is after 33 years. But in uh, two years, we have to reach 80, which means another uh, 18 to 20 points we have to increase. How is it possible? Two years. Average in an average 10 points each year. And I said, uh, we will find a way. We will find a way. So, what I did was, I asked, because the funding was given. So, we had 200 research scholars. So, all the research scholars were not, uh, only a few of them, they were receiving university grants as well as uh, some of them were JRS uh, scholars and all, some of them were receiving from the uh, project funding. So I said all of you will get 20,000 rupees, all the 200. All the 200 will get 20,000 rupees. But what I need is within six months you have to mail to the research director through your uh, supervisor and head that your paper has been accepted. Not in any journal. I need this article to be published only in three parameters. One is Web of Science, Scopus, or if you are social, belong to social sciences, index journal. If you do that, your fellowship will continue for the next year. And in another six months, it has to be published, which means at the end of the first year, you should have one article. And that article will carry the name of the supervisor also, which means it will go to the credit, will go to the department also. Previously, the thing is the uh, research scholars would publish to submit their uh, thesis. And once they go out of the uh, department, that article is forgotten. So the name, whatever they have done, is also forgotten. It is not linked to the department or to the institution. But uh, I said it should carry the name of the supervisor also, which means supervisor would get the credit. The department also would get, get the credit. And uh, by the end, when I am June 4th, 2021, I, when I limited office, our H index was not 80, it was 87. And today it has reached 90. Today it has reached 90. Because in Bharati Darsan, I was UP uh, director or coordinator. That is university with potential for excellence scheme. When UGC was having that scheme earlier. So we were competing with uh, seven universities in Tamil Nadu and across the India. At the end, only two universities were shortlisted. One was Aladapa University and one was Bharati Darsan. I was in Bharati Darsan. And then Anna University. We were sure of getting that. But unfortunately, again, our H index at that time was 89. I was talking about uh, 2015 16. So the, the point here is it is not that uh, somebody like in sciences they would do the right now, uh, as Dr. Ramesh was right in saying that uh, the department uh, uh, it has uh, six or seven people. Uh, two or three will be publishing their articles and the rest uh, they think uh, collectively they say the department has published. That is how we pub present before NAC. Even today NAC is not like that. Each and every individual counts. So each and every individual effort is counted, which means we are responsible. It is not only, it's a collective responsibility. Collective responsibility in the sense not one or two people making a contribution for the department's progress, but uh, a collective responsibility of all the faculty members contributing equally. I would say uh, it, it, number doesn't mean anything. If you publish one article in a, supposing you publish a, uh, an article in EPW, how many of our faculty members are publishing in EPW? That is one of the best uh, social science journals, I would say. 
that is the best uh, social science because even professor thorat has published it and the present uh, 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 s12 uh, vice chairman he is from botany department bhushan he has published an article in epw about uh, the changing scenario of education so leading say scholars they were published it is a weekly it's a weekly mind you 50 issues are there for one year but uh, you cannot publish just like that in epw because it's a refereed journal it is sent to the peer reviewed uh, referee and then unless otherwise your article is accepted with some modification sometimes i think then uh, you are known to the entire world of social if you take a statistics of how many of our uh, say colleagues either from history politics sociology etc are publishing in epw i think the number is very very minimum i say, i would say sometimes people who doesn't belong to the teaching profession they are uh, scholars they publish in epw that is, a, that is the paradox the paradox is because research is basically uh, it's a it's a labor of love research there is no shortcut to research if you if you think i am here to teach you shortcut to research i think you are mistaken you are grossly mistaken because uh, what i have learned till now is that whatever i have learned is insufficient after 2 years after 2 years i would feel that i am insufficient because the parameters of research are changing ever changing and uh, the goals are uh, always moving ahead when we were talking about good research in our own discipline then we were talking about uh, interdisciplinary approach then we said multidisciplinary approach today we are talking about transdisciplinary approach so the ugc and mhrd they are insisting there there should be trans display approach is uh, nep 2020 is insisting on that so they lay emphasis on trans display approach but sometimes we feel whether it can be achieved that is also foremost in our mind uh, because um, uh as uh, i was in office in alapa university the hod of biosensors came and he said uh, he is a young colleague of mine sir uh, uh this person has published in nature reporting nature's report you know nature also brings out uh, several allied uh, uh, publications and he is one of the authors sir and uh, it so happened that uh, i am receiving certain uh, whatsapp messages from my colleagues from history department and other departments saying congratulating me that uh, alappa university is uh, publishing in nature then i said uh, what's happening there are seven authors out of seven three of they belong to archaeology they belong to archaeology they were they had published this article about kiradi as dr umesh was saying the kiradi excavation was going on and uh, they were trying to say find the antiquity and dating process of some of these articles and uh, persons belong to dis different disciplines because basically excavation belongs to archaeology so naturally asa people and the archaeologists are there then you have people belonging to biotechnology biosensors and out of the seven can you ever imagine a history man is allied with biotechnology normally no but uh, washan sinde washan sinde was the vice chancellor of uh, deccan college pune he is now the chancellor and uh, he is a well reputed scholar and archaeologist 
and he along with Neeraj Roy, the Hindu carried this article in the front page. I don't know how many of you have read this. Neeraj Roy is a, a biotechnologist. Uh, he is an expert in genome uh, technology. So, which means uh, the excavations at Harappa, they were in the hands of the anthropologists normally. But not uh, archaeologists, though archaeologists were also involved, not biotechnologists. For the first time, Neeraj Roy and uh, Basant Shinde, they came together and they made path-breaking conclusions, which were not made because most of these uh, conclusions were observations. Though carbon dating is one scientific method by which you find the uh, dating of the objects, scientifically speaking. But uh, say scientifically analyzing the bones and the remains are not uh, the domain of uh, scientists because there is also a mental constipation of uh, intellectuals. Uh, real intellectuals, it doesn't happen. Real intellectuals, it doesn't happen. How many of you, are there any people from sciences here? Oh, quite a lot. Oh, my God. Because for knowledge there is no boundary. For knowledge there is no boundary. Is there anybody from physics? Oh, quite a lot. Good. Uh, so, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton. You know, is a well known scientist and uh, he is an author of many breakthroughs and also loss. But have you ever uh, come across Newton's uh, relationship with history? What is it? History. Newton's relationship with history. No. So if I ask that question, some of my colleagues, I ask this to my, some of my colleagues. Well, I was in Bharatidas and they said, Rajendra, you are pushing yourself too far. <laughs> and we know that you are making mark in your own discipline, but uh, you are carrying uh, uh, history to our, say, physics department and asking us this question. Kindly go and Google and say, even now you can do that, where you will find chronology of the ancient kingdom cemented. That's the title. Chronology of the Ancient Kingdom Surrender. This is the title. This is a pure and simple history book. It's a pure and simple history book written by Sir Isaac Newton. And uh, if you read the introduction, and uh, he said, by because his uh, uh, domain, one of his domains perhaps is uh, astronomy. So he said, uh, using astronomy, I wanted to set right scientifically the European chronology from the days of founding of Rome, because that is the starting point of European history, down to say the times of uh, Philip II, that was Alexander's father, Alexander the Great, his father. So he had a purpose in mind. He was not writing for the love of history, because he was he was uh, uh, say practicing his own discipline and uh, as I said there is no boundary uh, for uh, say watertight compartments for knowledge because after all if you ask anybody what is history, what is the meaning of history, what is this is different, what is the meaning of history, then the answer would be history comes from the root word, Greek root word historia which means inquiry. And you can add an inquiry after truth. That is an adjective perhaps. But if you ask what is science? And again, science is not a, a name or a term that was in existence when the practice of science came into existence. I hope I am, I am communicable to you. Uh, when the practice of science came into existence, the term science did not was not used. I am not saying this, you can go and find in volume 1, Encyclopedia 
of science and technology. There are 12 volumes. Volume 1 is very interesting, which I read. That is available in reference library, Bharat Singh University, where it says, science was called by the name philosophy of uh, 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 nature, nature, uh, philosophy of nature. It was an inquiry. But only during the modern period, you have the term science, which comes from Latin word, scientia, which means, again, to know. So if you, if you basically try to understand the term meaning of history and science, they are after inquiry. One says inquiry, other says to know. Both are inquiry. So the, 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 the point is that uh, uh, many of the scientists, many of the people who work with, uh, say, knowledge, they never created artificial boundaries. That's the most important. They never created artificial boundaries. If you want to understand, and that is the reason why we say the, uh, the man who stirred the stagnant pool of Indian historiography was none other than D.D. Kosambi. D.D. Kosambi was a Harvard trained mathematician statistician and he came to India and settled down in India. He was working with the Tata Fundamental Sciences, Bombay and uh, you know, uh, it was D.D. Kosambi who looked at uh, Indian history and culture. That was his pastime. That was, he, bread and butter was given by statistics. That is, that is his profession. But past time, he was looking at uh, Indian history from a different angle. So they said, uh, uh, you know, in fact, Dr. Umesh was really trying to find words and uh, meaning to explain research. It's very difficult. Abstract, you, can, you cannot, you have to experience. You have to experience. You know, a class was taken. Uh, some Vivekananda was... Uh, as a student in a, in a college, uh, he was studying there in Calcutta, I think. And then uh, that day, the philosophy teacher did not turn up. Then uh, the principal, William Hart, he was on rounds. It's a Scottish college. So he was going on rounds. He came to the class of uh, Swami Vivekananda. And uh, he, then he asked, why the class is empty? Where is the teacher? They said, the philosophy professor is, has not come. He's absent today. Then the principal started teaching philosophy. Those were the days. So he started teaching philosophy. And uh, suddenly at one point of time, he said, ecstasy. And he was trying to explain philosophically what is ecstasy. Because there are two things. One is phenomenon, the other is noumenon. Phenomenon is what you feel, you pain, pleasure, heat, cold. This is phenomenon. Noumenon is what you are experiencing right now, which means uh, what I am trying to reach you and touching your mind, or vice versa, is happening. So when you are trying to touch something, through your mind, that is no woman. That has to be experienced. So he said, uh, uh, however much I could explain the term, say, ecstasy, you may not be satisfied. So Narendra, you go to Dakshineshwa, where you, and every day, evening, there is a priest who will go into ecstasy. You can experience yourself. So he was uh, sent. It was William Hart who made him to go there and then of course rest is history. So the, the point is research also is like that. Basically research is like that. Unless and otherwise we ourselves experience what is research and uh, the involvement of ours in research, then uh, I think you will understand. Because there is a connection between research and uh, good research and good teaching.
something some sometimes people may feel teaching is different from research somebody could be a good researcher and uh, when they are asked to teach sometimes they may find it difficult because the articulation is sometimes it's a practice of course so uh, this may be true but it is not all the time true if you are sharing your experience as a researcher you could be a great teacher because it is uh, william hockett said the roots of good teaching are indeed nourished in the soil of research this is the golden words each and every teacher must remember and i was asking dr arnanandam to get a book r satinaraya to bring it before you you may ask what is the relationship between teaching research because dr ramesh and uh, your hod has uh, brought you here to understand the research but i think as a teacher you can practice research this is the most important in everyday classroom Now, before going to that, I would like to tell you, as a teacher, I joined a college, city college in Chennai. I was 26 or 27. So they said, uh, uh, Rajendra, you have a third uh, PA class, European history you have to teach. Uh, you go there to the class, and uh, I said, well, you go uh, walk down the corridor. and uh, on the right you will find the when you turn right you will find the class so i went there and i lectured for uh, 50 minutes class i came back the entire department was sitting in the uh, all the faculty were sitting in the department and they should ask uh, where did you go sir you only asked me to go and take the class sir i was in the class which class he said No, sir uh, see all of us are sitting here because our students have already gone <laughs> and uh, how is it that you are teaching you are alone teaching no sir you said the card that was my first class nobody came with me to introduce so they said uh, i was a old student of that college they said you i went and turned right you entered right or left <laughs> sir uh, left there was no students sir <laughs> In the right hand side, there were fifty uh, students sitting. So I entered. That was a chemistry class, my dear fellow. <laughs> you have been teaching history for the chemistry students for the fifty minutes, and we are wondering where you have gone. And said, uh, that was my first class, anyway. So uh, they were uh, uh, maybe they they thought uh, history is better than chemistry at that time. <laughs> so they were listening. When I entered the second day, uh, my class, I the of course there are history uh, faculty also here. So the topic given to me is European history, and European history you have a very difficult portion. I said I will take French Revolution or Napoleon. These are very uh, very lively subjects. I thought I could teach because I have to share this subject with my senior professor. Sir Rajendra always taught a difficult subject. Don't go for easy subject or easy lesson for that matter. Sir, what sir? You teach a easy question. Even as a student, uh, we used to leave it in choices. We don't uh, take the trouble of reading or answering the question. And as a teacher, I have to report. I sat down throughout the night. I prepared for four hours. i came to the class then i came to the class with a map and said look today we are going to uh, understand what is eastern question first of all basics are very important so you say you know what is eastern question because on the eastern side of europe there is a problem and that is the reason why it is called eastern question however it is also known as balkan problem that is what the book says that's what the book says so after uh, 40 minutes suddenly one fellow stood up sir i have a doubt said, how is it that this fellow is having because the entire subject is full of doubts <laughs> this question is full of doubts this fellow is asking only one doubt so 
I do not know where this doubt is coming from. Uh, because the entire subject uh, is doubtful for the teacher also, actually. Because so most of these teachers are here. And I say, what is your uh, doubt? So you said, uh, why it is called Eastern question? Because on the Eastern side of Europe there is a problem. So it is called Eastern question. But you also said, it is also known as Balkan problem. Yes, I did say. All right, sir, what, what do you mean by Balkan, sir? Uh, then it uh, came to me. Why this did not? Uh, this question did not uh, come to me. Say, so I was studying this in undergraduate, BA, MA. As a teacher, uh, throughout the day I was reading. For 50 minutes I was reading for five hours. But how is it that it has not come to me? Then I said, a good question. When the teacher does not know the answer, he always say good question. So immediately you satisfied the ego of the student. You dug the bouncer first. So I said, uh, it's a good question. But I looked at it because 50 minutes class. So I have to take the attendance, another 10 or 15 minutes. After attendance, let us see whether we will have time. I know definitely there will not be time. <laughs> so I said, I will see after 15 minutes. After taking attendance, let me see. Then I was uh, calling each and everybody twice. So I am making sure that uh, uh, definitely the bell will ring before uh, the completing that. So likewise the bell also rang. I said for the rest of the people I will mark. You give it in a paper I will mark and mentor it. I said your question will be answered tomorrow. Because I, know, I do not know the answer anyway. So I only said good question. So next day I went to the library. Early morning, there was one uh, Shengal Rai library, a very old man. But at the same, at that time, I'm also old now. But it was at that time, and uh, he said, Rajendra, what brought you to the library so early? He said, uh, I have this problem of uh, Balkan. I was searching all the history books. You read any textbook, you will understand. I hope you all the my uh, history colleagues would agree with me. There is no explanation for Balkan. It is only a statement. I said, uh, all right, uh, uh, said, what is this you are searching books? Go to Encyclopedia. Take B, Volume B. So I took Volume B, Balkan. The entry Balkan was there. It said, uh, Balkan is a Turkish word. When the Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople in 1453, uh, they started using Balkan. They started using uh, Turkish words in Balkan, Turkish language in Balkan. So, Turkish was one other country which shares its territory both in Europe and Asia. I suppose you know that, like Russia for that matter. So, say the, in Turkish language, Balkans mean mountain range. There is a mountain range running from east to west. So, hence it is named after the Balkan Peninsula. It's called Bal Balkan is mountain and the Balkan Peninsula. Balkanization, all these things came from this Balkan. So, the first question is, what I understood was, whenever I am in the classroom, or whatever I read, whenever I make a presentation before August audience, whether the local, national, international, wherever. If I do not know the concept, I will not say anything. If I do not know, or if I have to know, I will know. In other words, if I, I need to use it, then I should know what I, each and every word, I, that is what his research is all about. That is what his research is all about. How many, how many of us interact with what we read? We do not interact with what we read. We simply, ipso facto, accept what is there in the text. And the text is transmitted to the students. Mark Bloch, again a great uh, historian, who is the founder of an old school, a broad breaking uh, journal that they have launched along with Lucien Faber. Uh, called Analyst Review that has uh, uh, revolutionized 
historical methods all over the world, particularly in Europe, 1929. So Mark Bloch says, and he was killed, of course. He was an action historian. Uh, he was captured by Hitler's Nazi troops, and then he was shot dead in 1945. He was a uh, he was fighting for France. He was uh, in the French army. He was killed. And after he was killed, his lifelong friend, Lucien Febber, collected all his writings. He had already published a number of books. And then uh, it was published under the title Historian Scrap. Of course, the French title is different. Historian Scrap. If you are able to get that book, it's well and good. Some of the books, first of all, we must read. So research, again, is not uh, that you will get uh, to know by simply uh, knowing the food, I have also brought all those things. The one great danger uh, before uh, uh, you is I have only one slide. <laughs> but there are 60 slides. There are 60 slides. Whatever I am speaking there in the 60 slides. But these 60 slides are not uh, shown to you in tandem. Uh, that is not necessary. What is another important thing is research is analytical. Research is analytical. Research is interesting and also lovable. And research is a passion. Like teaching is a passion. Research is a passion. Then you will become a great researcher. So if you are going to learn research, you have to learn. There is no doubt about it. Let us see what we can learn also, by the way. So I, the first thing that, I, that entered my mind through that student, his name was Sridhar, I will never forget him. He taught me a lesson. The lesson is, never utter a word if you do not understand the word. Always try to understand the meaning, which I have did so many occasions. So I, even as a vice chancellor, sometimes I go to some department, they will give a text. So I may not have much time to go through it. I will just have travel time to go through it. There will be several places where they, they, it is, it cannot be explained. All the time I cannot Google and try to find it. So I thought uh, it is better to leave out and say what I know. That is much better. So this is what exactly, so the, the uh, underpinning is that uh, you should know everything what you say. For knowing everything you have to read. You have to understand. Mark Bloch said, understanding is the basis of knowledge. What is knowledge? Understand. So you are trying to understand. In the process of understanding your own discipline, I think uh, uh, your uh, knowledge component would increase and automatically you will become a researcher. I do not know how many of these three teachers have been using uh, Satinada here. Or anybody who is using Satinada here, volume one, Volume 1. No. Yeah, those days, uh, each and every sentence, Satinadayar, I think, uh, uh, belonged to uh, Tiruchi. He studied in St. Joseph's College and then uh, only he became a professor of Anamala University and he was well versed in uh, French also. A professor who knew French who used extensively Shambhavanur library um, in uh, Kodekana. So his students would say that uh, sometimes the French words are spoken so well by Satina. So you take that volume, kindly see that volume, kindly see that volume. That book of running to 250 pages or 300 pages. Each word, each sentence is something a very phenomenal and pragmatic in nature. Said about Indus Valley civilization many times in IAS that question used to be asked, that quotation. Indus Valley civilization is non-Aryan, pre-Aryan, superior to Indo-Aryan. I, I will never forget. Only just one and a half lines. But to explain that you have to write 10 pages. So, this is, a, this is the original word, that's the most important. He has not copied it from some source. He has used it from his own intellectual domain. 
and uh, for each and every page why i am telling you this is for each and every page he has given not less than 3 footnotes is a textbook mind you it is a textbook for ug it is being extensively used by in those days by civil service uh, those who are going for civil service examination and uh, the the book runs to nearly 300 pages i bought this book ananda book depot in chetpur that is where the, they were the only publishers you will be surprised to know i bought it around uh, 1982 or 83 for 7 rupees. For 7 rupees I got this copy. But now that copy I am trying to search. I do not know where, who has taken that copy. But I have given a lot, lot of books to others. But uh, there the most important thing is, which means he has used more than 300 citations. He has used 300 citations to write a textbook. Can you come across this? Today when we say write assignment, bring this assignment. Immediately the entire class in a two days or three days time, they come with fine binding with all uh, captions and everything because we are assisted by God internet and Google. So naturally, uh, all our assignments are so fine, almost similar. It is not mass copying. It is not mass copying. Even mass copying as a history. It's a history in the sense, if you read uh, Chinese history, particularly Sun Yat-sen, the morning star of uh, China, he was a medical student at Canton Medical, Ali's Mem uh, Medical Memorial Medical College, Canton. And uh, there were 12 students. So, it was run by British at the time and the examiner, the doctor who conducted the examination was a faculty. He went to his dean and said, dean kindly look, all these 12 people have copied. There is a mass copying of, uh, how can you, so all right, you conduct again. They are not taking it very seriously, but the doctors are called to conduct again. Second time also he found the same thing. Then he said, uh, this is how, then he said, what are the books you have suggested to them for reading? And compare this with the books. So the students have taken web pattern from the books and they have done it. Which means they have got an extraordinary memory. How did this memory comes? You know, when Sanyasin was a young boy, the, for kindergarten, the classes start at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, goes up to 5 o'clock in the evening. We send our children to school because they, we do not want trouble at home. So that uh, we will be very peaceful, at least till afternoon. Because only half day school. Huh? So they will come back. So those days, there it is not. Because uh, the teacher was telling the rhymes. The students were repeating. But one student was not repeating. And teacher normally when he teaches, uh, the entire classroom is, uh, uh, is in the vision of the teacher. Sometimes we may feel the teacher is not looking at us. Uh, that is a very myopic idea. So the teacher has a good teacher as the entire class in his vision. And activities also. He said, who is, uh, that is nothing, his name was Tawachiyam. Sanyasin's milk name, they say. Yeah, only at the age of 27, he called himself as Sanyasin after graduation. Everything. And uh, Tao, what, what is the problem? Are you not well? Why are you not repeating the rhymes? And Sanyasin said, I do not understand. I also said, only you have to understand. That is research. He was a small kid. You know, I do not understand. Like what they say in Tamil, Malayum, Payur, Mulayil, Etheriyum, Bola. So the teacher rephrased him. No. He said, come here. If you do not repeat the rhymes, you will become illiterate. 
because Chinese characters are 40,000, the old Chinese slang, 40,000 characters. If you want to remember all these characters, you have to repeat the rhymes. So that is the reason why the students, uh, young children, they are trained right from their childhood. So a scholar is one who, who knows from 6,000 to 9,000 characters throughout his life period, out of 40,000. Because now a lot of modernization has been done. So the mass copying is uh, what, and also research sometimes what we feel. Uh, there is a, a say scholar who said, if you copy from one book, it is plagiarism. If you copy from 100 books, it's a scholarly work. <laughs> if you copy from one book, it is plagiarism. So how many, is the percentage of plagiarism also allowed? 30 percent. So there is industry in Delhi, they say, it's South Delhi, you go, there is a place where I have seen myself and uh, they said, what do you want? 30%, uh, less than 30% or no plagiarism. The rates are different. Of course. So, if you pay the rate, uh, your thesis will be ready. So this is uh, what we do not understand or what is exactly research is all about. It is only copying. Definitely, it is not so because I was trying to tell you, as a teacher, if we are very uh, conscientious about our teaching and if you are going to prepare your uh, for class course, whatever course you are teaching, and uh, if you involve in each and every concept of your teaching very seriously, within a year or two, you will become a great researcher by yourself. You don't require with great training. Because as Sridhar, that student told me, you are trying to understand yourself, the subject. You are trying to understand the concepts involved in it. Supposing you are trying to say, understand what is a, exactly a national movement is all about. What is freedom movement? Is there any difference between these two? What are the theories of nationalism? Then uh, you try to understand what are, why this theory? We, all, we always say you, you have to practice theories, you have to introduce theories in your research. But most of the students, they come and ask me, what is a theory? Again, yeah, theory is not something uh, you invent. Theory is not uh, something that you invent. Because if there is a, uh, a aim, objective, and also hypothesis in social sciences. Definitely there should be a, a theory. And what is a thesis? How many of you are PhD? How many of you are MPhil? All. All. Is that wonderful? Yes. Yeah. Shall we go like this or shall we go by the slides? How many of you are PhD? I want any one of you to tell me what is the meaning of thesis. I, you know what is the meaning. Sometimes we get confused between meaning and definition. <laughs> definition is different from meaning. I said what is meaning of history, what is the meaning of science, I also told you. So now you know what is the thesis, what is the meaning. That is definition. Meaning is only one word. When you say history, it's enquiry. Science to know. You are defining. So I told you, you will get confused. I know this answer. That's why I told you that you will try to explain. But uh, it is not definition. I want the meaning. Pardon? That is a good guess. Good invention. Thesis is a Greek word which means my position. 
thesis is a Greek word which means my position. This is my position. So you, your thesis must explain what is your position. That is what you defend in your viva verse examination. But most of the viva verse examination, it is not a defense. It is an offense on the audience. <laughs> it is an offense on the audience. So we keep on saying what does the chapter after chapter. And ultimately, the simple question is one. They will ask questions. There will be many interactions. People coming from uh, uh, other disciplines, his own enemies will ask so, so many questions. But nobody will ask, what is your thesis? That, is the, that, is, that should be the billion dollar question. What is your thesis? So that is, that is uh, obviously missing the thesis or the dissertation, whatever it is. But you know, uh, theory of evolution is Darwin's thesis. Theory of evolution is Darwin's thesis. And uh, dialectical materialism is Marx's concept. And you have uh, Augustus Kant, uh, you know, positivist philosophy, his, uh, his own thesis. Positivism, his own contribution. And if you say Derrida, uh, it's a deconstruction is what he says. So, uh, like Arnold Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee is an organic theory of history. He said, history also is like a living organism. Civilizations take birth, they grow and they decay. So, this is what his thesis. So, there should be some underlying, uh, say, theme or current that you are supporting. You are, uh, uh, thesis or in your, even if it is an article for that matter. We are talking about good article. We are talking about good article. And again, uh, uh, for good article, again, how much we read is also very, very important. How much we read is, I am inspired by uh, books. I am inspired by books. Because I was trying to understand what is research. Even now, I am still trying to understand, uh, but uh, some of the books, you know, you have manuals, you have research manuals. One good research manual is, of course, thesis and assignment writing. I purchased this book for 70 rupees, Wiley Easton published it, and uh, it was published by Jonathan Anderson et al. Now that book costs more than 3,000 rupees. Amazon. Then I, I got a new copy, Wiley Easton, few years back for 350 rupees. The first book I got for, say, around 70 rupees or less than that perhaps. That was the first research book I bought. And later on, now, the cost has gone so much. And I want you to buy that book for one reason. To understand, there is a case study. Those who have read that book, uh, I had two copies. One copy I was going to somebody. I think the old copy is still with me. I don't know. Of course, new copy should be there. There is a case study. If I have time, I will... Uh, Take a photo, copy, and then send it to your HOD or to Dr. Umesh. He can share it with you. You must read. That is the inspiration part of it. First of all, you must get inspired by research. See, however much I teach you the rudiments of research, the footnotes, bibliography, what is bibliography, there are four kinds, all that are the slides. I have shared the slides there. You can take you can share with you. Somewhere in the north, 
and then uh, it, uh, he was traveling with this, say, PA and secretary. He said, uh, why is this theater is not now showing any films? They were passing through the theater on the way home to the office that is uh, secretary. This theater always shows only English films. They never show our regional films. Suddenly the secretary said, Sir, uh, renovation is going on. I know, this is English film again. I know, uh, they, they always show the English film. So, when I remember renovation, I remember <laughs> Uh, so, uh, books uh, is very important, reading is very, very important and uh, there is also a book by name, Modern Research by Jack West Person. If at all a methodology book could be read cover to cover, I think uh, Jack West Person's research methodology, I have read it a couple of times. I have read it a couple of times and that book was stolen from my desk because uh, when I as a faculty I used to keep a lot of books at least show that I am reading so I used to keep books and uh, I I feel whoever has taken it if he has read the book I think I am very happy I am really happy because uh, the, uh, it, has, it has really uh, say See, running to three, writing a 300 page, uh, Umesh was talking about uh, rhetoric, uh, rhetoric in history, say, qualitative writing. And again, uh, there is a conflict in social sciences and uh, history. Uh, there is, uh, there are something that you should understand also. We we'll come back to this point again, uh, book, uh, we are talking about uh, Jacob's person. I'll come back to that because there is always a point. The point is certain concepts uh, we should try to understand because the faculty of history are confused, confusion confounded sometimes because they do not know uh, what to write, how to write, what is good writing is all about. You know, J. H. Hexter. Is a renowned uh, American historian, J. H. Hexter. And uh, I read the uh, first J. H. Hexter's book. It is titled History Primer. It is titled History Primer. You know what is a primer? But book was around uh, 250 and 300 pages. So I read the book. Uh, now I always had uh, this. Uh, Kind of, I don't know. Sometimes I felt as I was doing PhD and all those things, I can read any book backward, forward, middle, wherever I want. So I read somewhere, some sections of the book. But I read the title again. Then I looked into the dictionary, what is a primer? What is this? It's called it a primer, but uh, what he is writing, I am not able to understand. After all, it is dealing with history. Why I am not able to understand? Then I read the introduction. There, J. H. Hexter cautions. After reading the book, if you feel that you are not able to understand uh, this book, will you understand, say, nuclear physics or thermodynamic principles without the fundamentals? So there is a hint. If you know fundamentals, you will understand this. Then uh, it struck me that I am lacking in fundamentals, even in history, first of all, than my own discipline. Then I came to know that J. H. Hexter is the person who has contributed an article in Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. You know, Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. I suppose, and uh, Bishop Duper College Library is one of the best libraries. So, as a faculty in Bharat, because at that time history was just coming up. I think they say 
you only brought this useless subject to it. Okay. All, we are all scientists. You, you are all, I have got good friends in science. So they said, you brought this history along with you. We, we made you futurology man, but you turned future into past. So I said, my future was in past, so I turned it into past. The, the, uh, I was saying something, I forgot. Huh? No, 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 you are wrong. Prima. Prima? Yes, tell me what is that? Prima. Prima. Yes, oh, good. J. Chester. J. Chester, uh, you know, after reading it, I thought uh, I'll understand. But uh, I couldn't. Then, uh, when I looked deeper into it, he was the one who wrote an article in uh, Encyclopedia of Social Sciences. Making history as a, a, a social science because he, the article title Rhetoric of History. The article's title, rhetoric, even today you can read that article. It's a very good article. Rhetoric of History. Uh, rhetoric of History is what uh, normally we use only words to express, words to express our. Uh, understanding in history because history is a uh, descriptive uh, say a, a discourse uh, normally history is also equivalent to literature history is also equivalent to literature and that is the reason why gm trevelyan's book social history of the english speaking people is read by people belonging to students belonging to English literature and uh, history, almost white public, because history has got two streams, unlike science for that matter. Science is practiced. The benefits of science are reaped by common people, no doubt about it. But uh, because science also makes uh, introduce or introduced and introduces the concept of egalitarianism in society. If you have money, you can travel by trade. If you have money, you can travel by car. If you, have, if you are a, a professor, and uh, you can travel by flight. So you are, you are equal to everybody if you have. And the same bread bought by uh, a millionaire also bought by a commoner. So science introduces egalitarianism in society. But at the same time, say uh, history for that matter is uh, also a common man's domain, common man's domain. Because many people think history is a easy subject. History is a easy subject. Because I was a faculty in City College, I told you, I had I put in some five or six years of service. I am closer to the sports also. So the PD master came and said, Sir, this uh, student, he is our number one hockey player. But you know, he is failing in one of your subjects. What is the subject? It's a Indian history, ancient Indian history. But she brought that fellow. I said, all right, you do one thing. You bring uh, two, those days, ten questions. They have, they have to write five questions out of ten. Uh, you bring two papers. Last year, uh, that is, uh, if it is April, you are going to take September and the April paper. You bring this. So I went through it. And I selected some 12 questions. You are lucky. More in administration is asked last September. So you can read Gupta. Like that, I selected it. After examination, that fellow came. I was so eager to look at the question paper because I have only trained him. He was also writing the answers also. He came very, he's a very good player as well as a good student also. Then uh, I found to my own dismay 
Some of the questions which were asked previous year were repeated, including Maurin administration, which I said don't read. You read only good thought. I know this fellow would have written only two questions out of ten. Then I said, uh, how did you do? Did you answer all the Yes, sir, I wrote all the answers. What about uh, this question? Maureen administration, I said you don't read. You read only Gupta administration. You also wrote that repeatedly. Yes, sir. Uh, did you attend the question? Yes, sir. How is it possible? You did not read the uh, Maureen administration. Sir, wherever Gupta comes, I changed Maureen. Very simple. After all, administration is continuous process, right? So, wherever Gupta comes, I change it. I thought, uh, I stopped going to the ground for one month. Because I have to face the PD master. And suddenly, after three months, this fellow came home. Uh, at home, they said that somebody is waiting for you. And I went, this fellow, uh, what happened, sir? Mudul in the sweet of pudding, sir. Why is pass? Kalanama. I passed the examination. I know only seven wonders of the world. And this is the eighth wonder of the world. And this fellow has uh, not written correctly, but yet passed. How is it possible? Because history teachers have a large heart. <laughs> they have a large heart. They can never fail a school. They can never fail a school. So naturally, uh, this fellow has passed it. That is where the wrong lies. That is where the wrong lies. That is where we go wrong. That is where we go wrong in the sense um, we take things lightly. We take things lightly. Because I was a student of Madras University for MPhil. I was going to archaeology department for epigraph. So there was a professor by name Krishnamurti. And uh, he used to conduct uh, tests and he, he has trained us to know Brahmi script. And we used to, that notebook where I was having for a long time, because we can write our own name in Brahmi script. So, so, within six months, he trained us in the script. And uh, that is uh, creating interest in the student. That is also art of teaching. It is very important. We read nearly 12 or 13 inscriptions. But when he conducted the test, uh, marks were given to me. And there was also a student, a fellow student. And... Uh, Good student, of course, a very good student. So the mark was one mark difference between us. Then I, you know, sometimes uh, human nature is such. I said, oh, how is that you got one mark more? Or instead of asking that question, I want to know how I got one mark less. But the question is other way around. How you got one mark more is the question in my mind. But anyway, I want to know how I got one mark less. So yes, I use the word contemporary. So it was rounded off. And then I looked into uh, my fellow uh, students' paper. Uh, the term used was contemporaneous. But it was not done in it. Then, uh, but uh, when he was teaching, he was using contemporaneous that I know very well. So I went to the Professor, sir, uh, yes, Rajendran, what brought you here? Any doubt in the answer sheet? Then he understood very clearly. He said, you are going to ask contemporary. Is it not? He said, yes. Contemporaneous is not equivalent to contemporaneous. Contemporary is different from contemporaneous. So, contextually you are wrong. That is the reason why I reduced one mark. By just using a different terminology, he reduced one mark. 
not reducing one mark is not a great thing but i have lost that uh, grade <laughs> along with my colleague so uh, so i understood another important thing in life that was while using your diction you are using your terminology words you must be very careful research is all about that research language is not the same language that we use whatever i speak to you i cannot write in a research paper this is for uh, say our own understanding we speak sometimes if i speak in the research language i think uh, Uh, it will be much more difficult sometimes so you say you take a footnote you take a footnote so your footnote begins with say indenting from the margin four spaces and then superscripting about the name as it is written for example k nilanga sastri about k nilanga sastri if it is uh, footnote number 1 one is superscript there is no what we call full stop between one and k nilanda sastri and k nilanda sastri separated by title by a comma and the title is if it uh, if you are going to print it and now computers do that so it is in italics in those days if you are going to write or type it has to be a underline and then in brackets you put the year of publication place of publication year of publication then close the bracket separate by comma page number and then you put page number if it is page you put 30 if it is pages 30 dash 31 then you terminate the entry by a full stop correct but your research manual will not speak this language your research manual will not speak this language your research language would say after the, the title title is separated the from the author by a comma title is underscore it is type or if it is in manuscript and then the place of publication the year of publication are given in parenthesis half parenthesis separated by comma and then page numbers are given and the entry is terminated with a period this is research language you get the point so unfortunately we use common man's terminology common man's language in research research like first of all why you are not able to publish in leading papers is this particular aspect very simple first of all why you are not able to publish is that you are not using research language If you are, if you want to master your research language, first of all you must read manuals, which means Jacques Bergson, for example, I say. It is like a poetry, or it is like a story. You can read the entire text, and then understand what he is trying to say. A good writing does not mean that you need to have, say. uh uh statistics statistics is a great uh, piece of lit there is no nobel prize for statistics is there any nobel prize for statistics no but there is a nobel prize for literature you must remember this so you can you can very well write analytically you can write with a good grasp of the subject you take uh, darwin's uh, origin of species it's a great classic piece of english literature it's a great classic piece of english literature and of course it's a, a path breaking scientific uh, uh, say discovery that is also is there that is what the science world claims 
but it is available throughout the world and you can read the book for the sake of literature that is the most important thing so you you need not feel diffident you need not feel uh, guilty for a discourse or a descriptive writing for that matter but what you say how you say is very important on what what are the question research what are your research questions that is very important and uh, statistics alone cannot uh, enhance your quality there is a book again you have to read which road to fast which road to fast the book written by two authors one is g r elton Godfrey Richard Elder, Cambridge University professor, who also wrote a book. That book I read, Practice of History, because there is a parallel written by a British author, E. H. Carr. What is history? That is a classic. It is all over the world. People know what is history. But uh, a parallel to what is history by a British historian is Practice of History. that is that is again he was the first person to use the word practitioners of history normally we say teachers of history but i learned this term practitioners of history from g r elton's book so the first of is written by g r elton saying traditional way of writing history and the second of is written by robert william fogel your four g robert william fogel was given nobel prize in 1994 he was a professor of uh, new economics at california university berkeley and uh, along with uh, his colleague north they published a book time on a cross and uh, fogel is known as a cleometrician cleometrician is to explain what is cleometrician matrix you know that is statistics cleo is the muse of history you cleo is the goddess of history so it is nothing but um quantitative methods in history so the cleometrician is a cleometrician he was the one who introduced the concept of cleometrics in us he wrote the second half uh, robert william fogel and robert william fogel concludes by saying how much of mathematical wizardry cannot bring about or enhance the quality of your writing or research this is that book you should read yeah yeah a person who got uh, nobel prize and abhirajan who was the professor of economics in iit chennai at that time he was alive he was the brother of pramananda kumar and uh, abhirajan wrote in hindu nobel prize for exploring the past nobel prize for economic students are here no oh yes yeah nobel prize for exploring the past and uh, he was the one who introduced a new concept because his question was had railroads were not introduced in us in 1890 what would have been the social saving cost for the society but the question is railroads were introduced in 1890 and it is one of the largest uh, rail networks in the world perhaps next to india but he is asking a hypothetical question so you use a model what is known as hypothetical deductive model for because for a question for a for an event that did not occur you will not have sources very simple so event has occurred where you will have sources 
but an event which did not take place but uh, you have to generate data for that purpose alone he was given a uh, nobel prize so this book which wrote to the past a classic book by the way is a new way of writing again one half is written by g r elton a traditional historian the other half is written by robert william forger a uh, cleometrician because when i say cleometrics in india also you should not think that uh, cleometrics is not used in india because the impact of what is happening around the world in our own subject also is uh, reflected in your research papers that's the most if you are uh, oblivious instead of using the word ignorant oblivious to the developments in our own discipline definitely we will not grow you know we will not know what is happening so i said dd kosambi was a statistician who came to india and he started practicing statistics in tata fundamental sciences but he was also writing history he wrote conventional history he learned prakrit he wrote learned sanskrit and he started reading and deciphering inscriptions it's a past time for passion he was doing it. and he also wrote a book called indian numismatics he wrote a book called indian numismatics kindly gave, i had this book i think i have given donated nearly 400 to 500 books to uh, university libraries of both avalapa and uh, bharati darshan <coughs> because i thought using those books keeping them at home is uh, detrimental both to me as well as to the books so people may think i am occupying large space so books were given to people who can use it this book you should why i say this is dd kosambi though he was not a, a historian but he was the torch bearer and uh, you know essence senses in historiography historians and indian historiography there he says uh dd uh, kosambi stirred the stagnant pool of indian historiography you know he was the first to use quantitative methods in history he was the first to use quantitative methods there is a manual there is a book by rodrick floyd uh, rodrick floyd if you take quantitative methods for historians it's a book available and uh, all these things are there in the slides we can go through the slides uh, at leisure and so dd kosambi the 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 subject of his research was uh, earliest coins called punch mark coins no writing only punches are i i told you he was not a historian he was not an archaeologist he had collected 12000 coins 12000 coins and he took 26 long years to write this 200 page book you will say sir we will never get a job sir if you are going to do such research we will be thrown out of the department if you are going to take <laughs> 20 years to write a, an article or a book because he had a job already those days uh, research is not tied to the bread and butter so naturally with passion one can do research and there i am sure no historian can read it no historian i read the introduction part of it very comfortably then i turned into the core chapter first chapter it starts with the equation it goes on till the end i am poor in mathematics and that is the reason why i took this if mathematics is not an anathema for that matter 
But statistics is very, very important. Statistics is very, very important. So there is also a saying, there are three kinds of lies. Lies, bad lies, and statistics. Lies, first grade. And bear lies just above. And top of bear lies is statistics. So if you are not having an eye for statistics, it can hoodwink very easily. In those days in our university, like unlike colleges, you have easily, uh, in some of the disciplines you'll have, math, uh, say for example, commerce, literature, sciences, you have not less than 60 students in a class, not less than 60 students. So we had ample classes, we were research people, no, we had only, now only, then only we had MA and all this. So ample. People would say, Jatan Ben, you attend Jatan Ben on that. Young class love, you pass it to a fun and very eighty-bed on that. Ah, yeah. What is your class attendance? We had, say, seventy-five. See, one man is saying, I had two students. Eight students have come and four are absent. So, you what perception you will have? Say, there are four students absent, there are four students. The second man says, I got 70 patterns, which means definitely this fellow has higher number of students. But uh, if you are good at statistics, we must ask how many students are studying in the class. He had only three students in the class. <laughs> Out of three students, two students have turned up. So a fellow who is running 12 students, he has got a better, uh, say, uh, credibility. And uh, this fellow says 70. Statistics is correct. According to NAC, correct. But unfortunately, to understand uh, the reality, I think uh, you, you may not. Uh, the same question was asked in history. The same question was asked. So very often we say uh, the period of Shadagan is known as golden age in history. So which means he has constructed, uh, say, Taj Mahal, this and that. No, that is not the point. So there is a professor by name Atharali. Atharali, Raleigh Muslim University. He has used, uh, he, uh, some of the professors, uh, most of the professors are well trained in Persian. Atharali is well trained in Persian. He has read the contemporary records of the chronicles. <clears throat> so he has taken a simple statistics. He has taken Two emperors before Jahangir, uh, before Shalika. He has taken Aurangzeb's time after Shalika. <coughs> For example, the price of, uh, say, day to day commodities like wheat, barley, oil, uh, pulses, all these things. So, how much one rupee could fetch? during these different periods and his statistics prove during the time of Shah Jahan, the for one rupee a commoner can buy many fruits which means the standard of life was higher comfortable this was statistically proved this was statistically proved so, which means stat statistics gives you accuracy, the most important. It gives you accuracy. And you need not elaborate many, you need not waste words. Another uh, greatest mistake is you give you a pie chart, you give you a diagram, you give you a flow chart, you give you a table, and then you also write for one of pages. 
not necessary. Your, uh, your uh, say statistics must be self-explanatory in nature. It must be self-explanatory in nature. You should not, need not, for that you have to read a thesis and assignment. Thesis and assignment writing, you have to read that book. Where it has been wonderfully demonstrated. And you have to introduce a table or a chart or a diagram in your text itself. And it should be continuous, how it has to be continuously numbered. So these are fundamentals, these are fundamentals which uh, we have to understand by reading, uh, I am coming back to Barzan, reading the text, reading the manuals first. And again, MLA handbook for researchers is a very good uh, manual. Chicago manual of style is also there. And uh, there is American uh, Psychology Association also has got a manual. But you have to follow. Say if you are, another important thing is if you are going to contribute an article for EPW. If EPW is going to follow a particular methodology of citation, you have to write your article only in following that uh, methodology of citation. If they are going to use uh, 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 what we call in-text reference, in-text references you are uh, citing uh, the Chola period um, or, uh, or say uh, Imperial Cholas mastered Bay of Bengal are converted into this uh, 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 backyard. Something like that he has said, okay, Nelakan Sastri. So you say Nel Sastri and uh, the page number or the year that is sufficient and the bibliographic details must be given at the end, that's all. And if you go into in-text reference and the, there should be con consistency in everything wherever you write. And if you are going to write an article for uh, uh, studies in history, if they are going to save publication, then the methodology what they are following, you should first of all cite what you call style sheet. You should try to understand. It is not what you have learned and what you have uh, done for your PhD. Uh, that is only examination. It is only an examination. But uh, for every uh, every journal, every uh, say publication, it differs. And um, another important thing is why I was also telling there is uh, history is in the public domain. So I was talking to a gentleman about the history and other things. Then he said suddenly, uh, "Sir, what have you written, sir?" He's a common man. We were traveling in a train. I said, I'm a history professor. Oh, okay. Those days I used to travel to our uh, southern districts as well as this way. I said, uh, I written some articles and books in history. Sir, I must tell you, I have read the Kalki's books, sir. Pony and Selvan. One of the best history books. You, you say layman things. Ponyan Selvan is a classic which I read many times. I read almost all uh, his novels. Sevagami, Sabadam, Pati, Great. But uh, yeah, layman things, sir, and the book. You say, what, what answer you can give? Because history in the public domain. Because so people think that uh, everybody can write history. Everybody can write history. Because you can write something on, in a, say, Hindu will not publish such things. You can write in the, the you can write in uh, popular, popular articles are there. If there is an event, immediately you write about the Velenachia, nothing wrong, all right. It's a public domain. You write about Madhu Sugar, you write, all right, people read. But that is not a research writing. NAC will not take that into account. NIRF will not take that into account. First of all. So, first of all, we must understand what is a refereed journal. 
How many refereed journals are there in our own discipline, which are published from India, outside India? You may think uh, <coughs> we are doing hard work. We are doing hard work, no doubt. Of it. Because I was contemporary to many of the IITNs now in the Department of Economics. Morley used to be there, Bhatri Narayan used to be there, Rajendran, who was uh, a professor and head of management studies in Nana University, used to be there along with us. They used to come to archives for the session. Oh, there uh, they have got a very good edge index. Whereas uh, I also use the library. I got my books published by Oxford, Warwick Alumni. But yet, um, where is the gap? The gap is all their articles are published in Scopus indexed or edge index. So, the subject is the same, malaria in Madras presidency, issues related to health, published in Oxford Journal, whereas we are writing in uh, South Indian History Congress proceedings, Tamil Nadu History Congress proceedings, and if you know Rajendran, you will publish it, because I was the general secretary, so like that you are publishing. Where, where we can publish easily. So every year two publications coming out. So we say I got 20 publications. Gone these days. These are no longer tenable. No longer you can uh, hold on to these things. First of all you should understand the your uh, play field. What is your uh, say uh, domain, intellectual domain. Why uh, you are not reckoned? You write one article in EPW and see the your uh, impact factor, which means it will be cited, as he says, it will be cited immediately because you have written in a good uh, journal, and people who read uh, that are professionals. And they are peace, so naturally they will use your article, they will cite your article, and that will increase the, the impact factor. Uh, because uh, uh, the EPW has got a great impact factor as a journal. Historians are not worried about H index till very recently. After I introduced the concept in Alapa University, <clears throat> history faculty used to come to me. Sir, in the, in the article for sir, in the for one sir, in H index Nala, sir. I was really thrilled. I was really thrilled because we were not worried about all these things. We are not at all worried about quality. We are not about worried about our own competition. We are you have to take cognizance of it. You cannot simply say history, we cannot publish like sciences. I told you, say nature historians have published, that's what I say, nature, they have published. If you are going to have transdisciplinary research, definitely your article will be published in all the leading journals, there is no doubt about it. For which our, uh, there, there is a change of attitude, first of all, there is a change of attitude. First of all, you should uh, think that uh, the discipline to which you belong has a great potential, first of all. Great potential. And uh, you can create, you can make a mark in this discipline. For example, there is a, again, uh, uh, unfortunate thing is, unfortunate thing is, when uh, Madras University was celebrating its centenary, <coughs> studies in uh, higher education, 
uh, or history of higher education was published by Madras University. One gives a description of the quality of education, number of institutions, all those. Second was statistics, volume. This was prepared by the professor and head of the department of history, Dr. K. K. Pillai. But when 150th year was celebrated, the volume was edited by this history volume, which contained all the details by uh, Mutaya. Yes, Mutaya, who passed away. Mutaya was a native of Karakudi school. He's a great, well read person. I shared the platform with Mutaya, yes, Mutaya. You know, there is a leading institute in Chennai. So I was delivering the valedictory address. He was uh, giving the keynote address. So I asked him casually, I read your article. He used to write in uh, Madras Musings in Hindu. He, used to write. he has published 14 volumes of documents and uh, released by the British High Commissioner in Chennai, where I was also present at uh, Crown Plaza before this demise. This happened just two or three months before this demise. Well up in English, at the same time, yes, he used to write only with the help of documents. But he was basically an engineer. Riti Kosambi was a statistician. But we are, uh, their bread and butter is not, uh, because their, their problem is engineering. And there are doctors, you know, in Twitch itself, Dr. Kaleko. Engineers, doctors, there is also Narsaya, he is also an engineer. They are making wards in their own territory. That is the most important thing. They are making what? Can, uh, uh, can you call in a doctor to construct a building? No. So, can you call an engineer to diagnose a patient? No. But you are calling an engineer to write history. I think if you ask me, it is a, it is a, it is a wound. It is a, say my self-respect is affected. I cannot call myself a historian. Because you are not taken into confidence. You are not taken into confidence. That is the quality of our writings, the most important thing. It is not magic that we can do. It is not magic that we can do. Now, as I was member of ICHR for six years, I have, I have brought more than 20 lakhs to this place. All youngsters got money. I don't know about Bishop even, but whoever has applied for uh, conducting seminars, conferences, I got their money. But projects, when it comes to projects, projects, you know, they were not even written in the basic format. They were not written in basic format. Without basic format, you have a backdrop or what we call overview overview of the subject, then you have to have review of literature, then you need to have what is known as objectives, and if you can aim an objectives, and then you can also have hypothesis, you can have hypothesis. And then about a methodology, what kind of a methodology you are going to use, and if possible, you can also add from where you are going to collect sources, how you are going to collect sources. But this must be written in, if not in a, uh, say, English, English, at least uh, correct English it must be written. There is uh, great, uh, most of the projects are brushed aside because the title itself is wrong. So there is a, first of all, you should know what is an open title. What is a research title and what is a popular title? 
we set question paper saying uh, describe the contribution of Mahatma Gandhi to the national movement. So the title of the article is Contribution of Pani Besan to Home Rule Movement. So you have an a priori. Uh, you already concluded. What is research? What is research? So you. So that is that is the most important thing. Laymen may not know. See, everybody is seeing what is everybody is seeing. Say the sun will go to a beautiful place, a resort, Kanyakumari. You uh, you see you give you a tweet or put a status saying I, I saw today sun rising in the east beautifully on the horizon of uh, Bay of Bengal and evening I saw it sitting in the Arabian Sea and, and from this place I saw. This is correct as an observer. Is it scientifically correct? It is correct. Everybody all the 125 million seeing the same thing. But uh, what you have to write, I saw sun coming in front of, uh, uh, I am moving in front of the sun in the morning. Evening, I saw sun coming behind my, I mean, the earth, uh, coming behind the sun. That is what uh, heliocentric theory. So, he said something people did not see. That is research. What everybody sees, you are going to write, that is not research. That cannot be research. What people cannot understand. Because the researcher question is something that uh, others cannot understand. That where you need research. Even if you are going to do research, others can also say the same thing. Where is the fun of uh, your contribution? Where is the, the question of policy making? Because the government needs uh, policy papers. Research is tied to the uh, uh, governmental structures. Because they cannot do research, the administrators cannot do research. Now the Tamil Nadu government asked Anna University to assess the stability of buildings after the rains. Why they have involved uh, structural engineers there? Because that is their job. They have to have the parameters of doing it. In fact, uh, your research must bring out something tangible for the society. First of all, it has to be linked to the society. Most of the research. What we call developmental research. It doesn't mean that if you are going to do research in history, that you will not contributing to knowledge. Definitely not. Definitely not. So you ask questions sometimes that will provide you answers. So how is it that uh, a place like uh, you are doing a architecture or a temple study, you have Bragisura temple constructed on uh, say plains, on the plains. You don't have no mountains. First question is from where the stone has come, for which you need to answer. And while constructing whether they have used the traditional materials, how this plan was drawn, and what type of, uh, say, blueprint is there. So if you answer all these things, there are, these are research questions for which you have answers. But our research is that it is a huge construction covering say two acres of land. It is in a square in shape and the building has so much of uh, height and there is 80 ton stone. These are visible to everybody. There are uh, say uh, deities here and there that is visible. What is invisible? What, what, how do you say, for example, uh, with Tuakadi you have this uh, water management institute is there, Tuakadi. 
there was one Gopa, Gopala Krishna. He was uh, the chief uh, PWD engineer, even during the time of uh, uh, N.G. Ramachandran. So we attended, as a young faculty, I was invited as a futurology, we went there. You know, he was saying one thing, if the government wants us to construct a dam across River Kaveri in Tirichi, we will select the place where the colony is constructed. Because we know now the knowledge that is given to us by the, uh, say, modern engineering parameters, we apply that and we select this place. But how is it possible 2000 years ago the same idea struck these people? How did they select? You will not find answers. Very simple. But now if you give answers to this question, engineers are interested. Engineers are interested. But we are always selecting topics which are say, obvious in nature. You are selecting topics which are obvious in nature and uh, temporary in uh, its uh, usage. You produce an article, you publish it, you submit your thesis. You produce an article, you say that uh, five articles are necessary for next promotion, you get your promotion. That's all. What is the real utility of that article? Whether you have generated knowledge out of it, that is most important. And uh, if such articles are written, even if you write 10 articles, every year one article is enough. And if that article is, you are going to write such articles, there are humpty number of good journals across the disciplines. Across the disciplines. You can write about uh, uh, medicine our principal practices in ancient India or medieval India or Tamil Nadu, how they have practiced, what the texts say, because the uh, uh, what uh, uh, Indian Science Academy, they were interested in all the ancient texts, even earlier. If you are going to write about ancient science, they want the evidences. The metallurgy, for example, how metallurgy was used in ancient India. Now, I was also explaining to you what is a theory. <clears throat> so, history is basically interpretative science. It is not science. You got nomothetic. Nomos means uh, it is, uh, 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 say, universal in character. That's a Greek word. Ideographic ideas means peculiar in character or unique in character. So history is unique in character or social sciences, most of the social sciences. So as a, a social scientist, what is our uh, uh, contribution to a particular problem that we are selecting and how we are bringing out this particular, say, solution. That is uh, very, very important. I don't know. I think what's the time? 40. I think it's time for uh, moving beyond. Uh, because I, I like my own voice perhaps. <laughs> request to you is kindly keep yourself abreast of the discipline disciplinary advances first of all you should know the impact of the all the developments in your own discipline whether you are interested in ancient india medieval india or modern india that's the main thing you can have but first you should understand that uh, the theory, I said what is the theory, D.D. Kosambi has provided a good example for a theory. All of you read, out of 16 Janapatas, Magadha became an empire. That is a statement in all the books given.
But D.D. Kosambi theorized it. How did he do that? He said, uh, say, Magadha had a huge army, what we call a standing army. Army cannot be sitting. When we say standing army, they were paid by the state. Their job is to fight, for which they are paid either in kind or in cash. In those days, kind also. They were given lands. And uh, for giving, they had nearly 2 lakh soldiers, 10,000 elephantry, similarly 5,000 or more uh, cavalry. And all these people, they have to fight with what? With iron implements, swords, spears, bow and arrow, everything carried iron. Which means Magadha must have monopoly over iron. So, and they, are, they have to give uh, lands to the army people also for their sustenance, which means forest must be uh, brought under cultivation, which is called reclamation. For destroying the forest, you need iron implements. For all these purposes, iron played a major role. And uh, Magadha had iron ore under its control called Rajgrita. Rajgrita is a place where iron ore is. That is the reason why Magadha became an empire. That is a theory. There is no evidence for it. You get the point. So E.H. Kaur says in his book, What is History? Facts are like an empty sack. Facts are like an empty sack. And it is the historian's thoughts that full fill the sack and gives a shape to the sack. And fact themselves cannot become history. Very important. A mere fact is not history. It is the historian's interpretation which gives life to the fact. Most of the time we think in the essay in Nalaya Sayidi, 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 Varalar, Varalar. You cannot mix both. So you can have information. When it approach says, spirit, fact is like a body. You need a body. And if the body is not alive, it's a cross. So life is spirit. Life is history, is it? That history is provided by the historian. That is the reason why he is called historian. Facts are there. Everybody can say newspaper carry facts. Every, everything carries facts. So all these things become history books. No. Which means historian need to provide his interpretation. And that is where your theory enters. That is where your theory enters. That is where research is needed. That is where you are going to provide your knowledge. So, whatever, uh, no, the NIT students came way back. At that time, it was called Regional Engineering College. They got a project. The project was this Tepakulam at our uh, Chatram, first time, uh, Rockford Temple. How water, it's a huge tank, huh? how water is filled into this tank, how water is, uh, it's a group project, sir, uh, because uh, this, uh, this tanks, uh, temples are associated, historical question, they are, came to the department. We were finding difficult to build the library. So he asked the question, then I said, uh, <clears throat> do one thing, go to the library, there you have general library, uh, district gazetteer. Otherwise, go to St. Joseph College Library, there they have district gazetteer, which I know. You see this aspect, Trichurapalli gazetteer, you will find. They came back two days later. These are engineering students, mind you. They came back. Sir, we saw, sir, there are only one paragraph 
it was built by night and this is because so many steps are there so much of depth is there but the, our question is how this tank is filled how it is water is uh, old water is going out because we cannot film this is a very uh, rocky terrain then i could not give the answer because we don't ask such questions you can only say it is beautiful tank is filled with so much sometimes you also find crocodiles you do not know how crocodiles get inside we sensationalize things but we don't uh, go after knowledge that is a problem then i but i had uh, since i have worked with archives for a long time said go to archives you have got pwd uh, files are there definitely the british uh, people would have documented you go and see it you know those people came back after six months Sir, thank you, Mr. Sir. Uh, uh, we completed our project. Oh yes, sir. It was useful, sir. We consulted. No, the answer is this is constructed. Uh, the cavity is downstream. It is constructed at a place where, whenever there is a rainfall, all the rain would come to this place. If before that there were no shops also, so when it was constructed, all the rainfall would pass through this territory and pass into the downstream cavity. So they have constructed this so whatever uh, rainfall Tirichi would receive at that place, definitely all the water will come to the tank. So you need not artificially fill the tank. Number one, but they have kept a huge hole. on the say uh, southern side of it or the uh, northern side of it on the side of the river kaveri so whenever the new water flows inside from south automatically the same amount of water it is simple hydraulic principle goes out of the hole it is appropriate technology so water is automatically filled automatically clean and uh, this question never comes into the minds of his that's the point this question never comes into the minds of the historian say when you enter uh, a temple in uh, particularly kumbakonam when the uh, sun moves from uh, say one uh, the dakshayana to uttarayana let's say that is around june first week sun rays enters the sanctum sanctum there will be huge crowd but the most important thing is people go there to see it as a, uh, a kind of a celestial uh, happening but historians writing about it also writes it but most important thing is there is a concept which eludes the normal belief in western uh, science which i have read faith is on the one side and science is on that is reason on the other side there are two poles apart it was thomas aquinas who gave right to make a compromise but uh, you cannot bring both together use them but here this temple is a faith but the construction of the temple is based on science so how the rays can enter only during this time one week that is based on astronomy civil construction and the movement of the planets unless in other ways you know this you cannot construct it do we do we say that do we have this understanding no so if you can take a project and say how many of our uh, say places of faith have used scientific principles you will get a huge funding from indian institute of science <coughs> indian national science academy <coughs> or ds but we don't do that 
But your questions are, we take a survey of the temple, these temples are here, the length, the breadth, the height, the painting, everything we say. What is the knowledge component? That is absolutely nil. So, if you write this, you will have a publication in Nature, you will have a publication in uh, any leading science journal. Then your rating goes up, naturally. When NAC visits and say a Department of History in uh, collaboration with the uh, Department of Science, they have published this article in this, you see your rating. So it is not simply writing, increasing your articles. It is increasing your quality. Incre increasing your, uh, say, and you also say this contribution has been made by this department. A genuine contribution in the sphere of knowledge. That is what is required. So, <clears throat> you have done a wrong thing by inviting me. Yeah. And uh, I have so many slides, uh, I don't know. Yeah, right. but it's not working. I have pulled it out. That uh, it's there. This uh, it used to be. Ah, it's right. You should not do it. That's the reason why I have this. <laughs> now, this is what I said. These are the people who made contribution to four point eight degrees. <clears throat> We also talk about uh, these are uh, Dr. Mesh also said all those things. Speaking with competency. Satina, this is a book I am referring. Kindly see this book. So you need all these things. What is the primary source? What is the secondary source? What tertiary? Tertiary source should not be cited. Textbook should not be part of it. <laughs> Internet is what does research today. Not the, of course, bibliography. Well, these are the types of bibliography I was referring. Index reference we are already seen. <clears throat> Grammar and I also said the language is very important. Mm -hmm. Constitutional research. Uh, this is what I was uh, Professor Vatun Shinde mm -hmm. and Neeraj Roy. Uh, Laduri, of course, this is a very interesting thing. In fact, uh, uh, environmental history. Uh, those uh, teachers of history teaching modern uh, Europe, you have a scene in uh, French Revolution where the women of uh, Paris uh, take a march to Versailles, 40 kilometers away to the king's palace where uh, <clears throat> the king and queen reside. And uh, when they came there, king said, uh, this, uh, there is a march of women large numbers. So he asked Mary Antoinette to go and uh, address the gathering. So she came out onto the balcony and then said, what made you to walk from Paris to Versailles? What do you want? Then the crowd said, we want bread. We don't have bread, we want bread. Then she said, so innocently, if you do not have bread, why don't you eat cakes? Then immediately they said, come with us. That was a turning point in French Revolution. They made the king, queen and their son to come along with them. That's a turning point. The king cannot, you cannot order them to come. But made, they made the king to come along with them to Tuileries, a building in Paris. While on the way back they said, we have the baker, baker's wife and baker's son. 
But most important thing is never answered. Why there was a shortage of bread? That is a staple food, which was not answered in our books. We never answered that. And it was Emmanuel Lee Roy Laduri in his famous book, Times of Feast, Times of Famine, answers. And, and yeah, Al Gore also, uh, in fact, uh, he has, uh, Al Gore has identified this in his book, Earth in the Balance. He cites that. <clears throat> Because there was uh, four or five seasons, a bad uh, season, which means continuous snowfall. We have drought seasons here. There are continuous rain, uh, uh, snowfall. So there isn't a growth of even uh, out of grass. So naturally, there was a shortage of food. So this was not explained. The environmental cost was never explained in French Revolution. And that is what exactly you need. That is a research. That is the research answer. So we, we believe in uh, cliches. But uh, history is not mere rhetoric and cliches. You require, of course, publication. The uh, H index, I10 index. These are very important. And uh, you must have an eye. You should understand them first. And predatory journals, uh, Dr. Mesh was talking. Use of libraries, internet, funding, need of the hour. Of course, this is the way in which, how it has, one example is given. Normally, you will put all tables, this and that. That should not be the case. There is a format for which it has to be done. And these are the books that I was referring. And as in all this, there are many books that I have referred during my, uh, so, all categories of research ultimately serve the people and society. Science and technology cannot be introduced in vacuum, in society only. Then social scientists, I consider historians also as social scientists. So, <clears throat> more indispensable. So it is your research is not that uh, for increasing your H index, but more importantly, if you are going to make a distinct contribution to research, certainly, um, uh, should be by college and Department of History and Social Sciences. Other branch, I, I think it's a general issue to all the uh, faculty. They, they must take uh, research as a passion. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought and the gratitude is happiness, double by water. I request Ms. R. Nedekmadi. Assistant Professor, Department of History, to grace the stage with vote of thanks. A warm and a graceful afternoon to our most valuable, honorable chief guest, management committee, worthy teachers, and everyone gathered here. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks speech and acknowledge the contribution of those who work really hard to make this program happen. On behalf of the department, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed chief guest, Professor N. Rajendran, former Vice Chancellor, Alagappa University for joining with us today and enhance our mind with your enthusiastic words. Thank you, sir. Also, I extend really hearty vote of thanks to our Vice Principal Project, Dr. A. Umesh Samuel Jabasilan, sir, a Bishop Iba College, who spared time from his busy schedule to grace, uh, uh, to grace the occasion. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to thank Dr. Satya Silan, sir, Head Department of Computer Science, for participating in our program. Thank you, sir. A special mention to our respected Head of the Department, Dr. Femla Alexander Mann, for being the catalyst who stimulated us to, uh, to do our best and standing as a pillar of strength. With a deep sense of appreciation, we thank our loving faculty for their untiring efforts who have participated in this program. I would also like to thank the people who work behind the scene to make, the, to make this program happen, our technical arrangement team and our team six staff. Thank you all. Last but not the least, a big thank you to each and everyone who made this program useful for all of us. We value you and every moment that you stay in this temple of learning. Thank you all.
Thank you, ma'am. It's time to end our program with national anthem. जनगणमन अधिनायक जय हिंद भारत भाग्य विधाता पंजाब सिंध गुजरात मराठा द्राविड उत्कल बंगा इंद्र हिमाचल यमुना गंगा उच्चल जलधि तरंगा तव शुभ नामे जागे तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन जन मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे